We're on day three of our meeting in ASCP 2014. It's been an enlightening week so far, but I guarantee you this next session is going to be even more so. So throughout the last couple of days, you've heard a common theme. We've talked about the workforce, we've talked about our concern around financial challenges, even that that faces students facing their own education and how they're gonna pay for it. But we're also very concerned and we want to focus on honing the leadership and honing our future leaders of our profession. Each and every one of you has a role in helping us do that. We talked about how you can get involved and what next. But our next speaker is going to talk about how one person, one person can make a difference. Now having traveled through Africa extensively and seen some of the world's health problems firsthand, Barbara Pierce Bush was inspired to make a difference. She was inspired to harness the passion and the energy of the skills that she has to help a generation of patients overcome malaria, HIV AIDS, and epidemics of our time. And the difference that Barbara made was that she founded the Global Health Corps. She's the president of this Global Health Corps, an organization that places fellows around the world to bring change to regions of the world that need it the most. And her vision has allowed for young leaders, just like we're trying to cultivate in our own profession, Young leaders, whether their skill sets are in finance or supply chain management or any other fields that are atypical in the fight against disease and poverty, to bring their skill sets to an experience to bear in delivering health service solutions. Health service solutions, just like we've been talking about this week. And provide ready access to quality care. So today, Barbara's gonna share with us her vision how everyone around this table, this room, and this world can help bring to their communities solutions to the health crises. Please join me in welcoming Barbara Pierce Bush, daughter of the former President of the United States. Thanks. Enjoy. Hi, good morning, y'all. A big thank you to Dr. Holliday for having me. Um, I'm so excited to be with everyone from ASCP this morning. I heard I missed some karaoke last night. Um, so I hope your morning is off to an equally as fun of a start. Um, I am excited to be here this morning with y'all to share some stories about the places that I've seen, the people I've met, and especially the remarkable young people who inspire me every day. It seems like a long time ago that my sister Jenna and I were young people trying to persuade our parents never to leave Texas. When our mom and dad set us down to tell us that our dad was running for president, we quickly tried to veto that plan. <laughs> we wanted to live normal lives as normal college students, but we all know how history played out and I'm happy to share a few lessons from that this morning. My sister and I had first seen the White House through the idealistic, innocent eyes of seven-year-olds. For the four years that our grandfather, who we call Gampy, and our grandmother, Ganny, also known as the enforcer in our family, the, for the four years they were in the White House, my 13 cousins and I spent vacations and holidays running around its endless corridors. We played house in the East Room and hide and go seek on the South Lawn. And on Halloween, we trick-or-treated up and down the aisles of Air Force One, I dressed up as a vampire and my sister dressed up as a box of juicy fruit. <laughs> Our imaginations were informed and excited by the beauty and the stories of what a truly magical place. And at the end of our dad's term as president, it was an honor to tour Sasha and Malia around the White House and see their tiny, young eyes and imaginations excited by such a special place. So though as 18 year olds, we were not quite as enthusiastic about our parents returning to DC, it didn't take long for my sister and me to realize that an incredible opportunity had been given up to us. The chance to watch and learn from history unfolding before our eyes and to sometimes be a part of it. Tagging along to meetings or joining trips with my parents, Jenna and I were engaged. We were totally enthralled by witnessing policies that are changing lives. You see, Jenna and I were always aware that we come from a family of nerds. I don't know how many of you have a librarian for a mother, but sometimes it seemed the excitement would just never end. <laughs> and I know that my mother was here with y'all two years ago. 
In her 20s, our mom's idea of a really good time was naming her cat Dewey after the Dewey Decimal System. So when her autobiography, Spoken from the Heart, was published a few years back, Jenna and I could not wait to tear into it. We were eager to discover the wild, secret life we just knew our mother had been hiding from us. Instead, we learned that when she was a girl, she harbored a deep and abiding passion for, of all things, school supplies. It is all there in the book, the rhapsody that she feels for, quote, the bright lead pencils and the thick practice paper. <laughs> it's in there. At recess, while everyone else was jumping rope and playing games, she would stand quietly next to her teacher. Even in the second grade, she had a sweet, curious soul of a librarian. So she didn't have a wild and secret life. It turns out she was hiding nothing from us. And for any of you that met her two years ago, you know why. For us, she was always there in plain sight. We knew who she was because she knew who she was. And she not only brought us into the world, she brought the world to us. It was through our mother's and our dad's eyes when they took us on travels as president and first lady that we experienced the beauty and richness of other cultures. We were inspired as we witnessed their, social, their work for social justice, women's rights, global health, education and literacy in countries like Burma, Afghanistan, and Tanzania. Oh. <laughs> like good teachers, they showed us what they wanted us to see, told us how we could do something about it, and then left it up to us to decide whether to live our lives in a way that would help bring a little light to a sometimes dark world. And it was through traveling with my parents that I rather unexpectedly got involved in global health. As a 21-year-old architecture major, I was lucky enough to take two weeks off of my fancy summer internship in New York City to be on the ground for the launch of PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, which I know that ASCP is a big player in. I was lucky enough to travel to five countries in East and Central Africa for the launch and, of course, as all of y'all know from working on these issues, witness firsthand the roadblocks that so many people face in obtaining the appropriate health care that they need to live happy, prosperous lives. For me, it was a harrowing image to land in Uganda and see hundreds of people waiting in the street for drugs that we had had that were available in the United States for years. And I vividly remember standing with my own mother next to another mother who had brought her tiny precious girl to the launch. And as I talked to her mother, um, I said, you know, your daughter is so beautiful. Is she three? And she laughed and she said, no, she's seven. She's not little because she's young. She's little because she doesn't have access to health care. And her mother dressed her up and brought her to the launch um, of a health care program, even though she probably didn't live much longer because she knew what this program would mean for her other kids and what it could have meant for her daughter's future. And seeing that people's lives, like that little girl's, were limited and cut short simply because they were born at the wrong place, at the wrong time, motivated me. Heartbreaking memories like this were equally or more so matched by inspiring mem memories, witnessing community health workers, family members, community members, every single day making a commitment to change the status quo. So following that trip, I became obsessed with working on global health issues. I dropped my architecture major, um, I enrolled in every global health class that was offered at Yale and got to work. And luckily, I was only one of hundreds of thousands of people in my generation that want to serve others for the sake of health equity. Um, it's really exciting right now because interest in global health is at an all-time high. As we've seen in the United States over the past five years, 80 universities have started brand new global health programs, all driven by student demand. And organizations like the One Campaign and Red have piqued the interest of hundreds of thousands of young people that want to move that interest into action. They want to use their skills to solve gaps that exist in health. And I don't need to tell you all about the gaps that exist in global health, but just the idea that we have the tools to prevent and treat cervical cancer, HIV, malaria, Ebola, et cetera, and we're not doing it. The fact that the science and medicine is there, yet millions of people die every year from preventable and treatable illnesses the gaps that I'm referring to and the gaps that I know y'all work on every single day. And though health statistics right now are extremely daunting, I would argue that they are matched with the tenacity and optimism of a new generation of leaders who are committed to solving these problems. Health systems are weak, 
and we need more young leaders, we, not young, young leaders, we need more leaders to fix them. So in 2009, five colleagues and I started Global Health Corps to harness the passion, energy, and skills of our generation to confront the world's massive health challenges. We figured that we could take this overwhelming interest that so many young people have in global health and move that interest to actually solving problems, move that interest into action. We are building the next generation of global health leaders, and we are motivated by the belief that great ideas don't change the world, great people change the world. So our model is one that's based on talent and human capital. When I first met my co-founders, we were inspired by Teach for America. We had all recently graduated from college. I know when I graduated from Yale, 25% of my class applied to Teach for America. And we wondered, could we build a similar model but apply it to health? Um, so what we do is we partner with existing nonprofits and ministries of health, organizations like Partners in Health and Clinton Health Access Initiative that I know um, are big ASCP partners. And our partners identify gaps that they have and then we competitively recruit young leaders up to age 30 to serve with them for a year to try to lessen those gaps. Our fellows always serve in teams of two, so it's one fellow from the country where they're working partnered with an international fellow to ensure that it's a truly global group of young leaders working on global health challenges. To find our fellows, we competitively recruit, we train them intensely, we coach them professionally throughout the year, and we build a cohesive community of young leaders who will make an impact in the year that they're with Global Health Corps, but who will build the skills that they need to address these issues throughout their careers. Um, we know that Global Health Corps is just the launching point for so many of our fellows for the rest of their lives working on these issues. And so we ensure that they understand policy change and systems change, that they understand advocacy, that they understand entrepreneurship. So they can quickly gain more responsibility and more influence in positions to truly change policies and affect the lives of millions of people. And since 2009, we've been lucky enough to work with 450 exceptional young leaders in the United States, in Newark, Boston, DC, and New York, and in Burundi, Rwanda, Uganda, Malawi, and Zambia. From counseling homeless youth on chronic disease management in Newark, New Jersey, to building electronic medical record systems in Malawi, to screening and treating cervical cancer in Zambia, to ensuring that HIV positive mothers have the tools that they need to birth HIV negative babies, our fellows are positively affecting the lives of hundreds of thousands of people around the world. Oh. <laughs> and we're pretty excited um, because we just launched our new class of 128 fellows and we were excited and overwhelmed that we received 11,000 applications for those 128 positions. So, Needless to say, they're pretty great. Um, and you may wonder what we think the next generation of global health leaders look like. Well, they're pretty diverse. They're working on health systems. And um, they don't always look like what you expect they would. So two of our fellows are named Jeffrey Misomali, who's from Malawi, and Emily Bierce, who's from Hudson, Ohio. Jeffrey is 27 and Emily is 24. So together, they are 51 years old. <laughs> they equal basically a young baby boomer. And Jeffrey and Emily represent the powerful notion that bright and motivated young people can make an impact in the field of health now while gaining the skills that they need for their careers. After watching a close family member pass away from HIV, Jeffrey was motivated to get his business degree and then get to work on ensuring that no one else had to go through the same life that he had. Um, he joined us in our first class of fellows and was partnered with Emily Bierce, who was a recent MPH graduate. And they um, paired up to work with our partner organization, Clinton Health Access Initiative. As all of you know, um, it's so exciting right now to be working in health because if you're an HIV positive woman, you can have an HIV negative baby. We can have an HIV free generation in our lifetime, I think. Um, and so Emily and Jeffrey started working on this specific issue. And they worked with Chai in a district called Machinga. It's a very rural district in Malawi. It is. Um, a district of 300,000 people, when you um, are heading to Machinga, you'll drive for hours and hours through on dirt roads through beautiful mango fields, and you'll pull up to a health center and it'll be packed with mothers um, gossiping with each other and playing with their kids. And the thing about this district of Machinga is that 25% of the people that live there are HIV positive. So in the year that Jeffrey and Emily worked with Chai, um, they were rolling out a PMTCT program. They were um, actually implementing best practices that had been created from mothers to mothers. So they would 
and this year try to enroll every single HIV positive expectant mother into a program to ensure that she had the mentorship that she needed to have a healthy baby and to ensure that they had the medicine that they needed to have an HIV negative baby. So in one year, Jeffrey and Emily rode around Machinga and they enrolled 7,000 HIV positive expectant mothers into this program. As happens nine months later, all of the mothers gave birth to their babies. And what was exciting is all 7,000 of them gave birth to 7,000 HIV negative babies. And so in that year, um, Machinga, the district, um, not a single baby was born with HIV. And Jeffrey and Emily were able to impact the lives of 7,000 families, 7,000 mothers, 7,000 babies, and obviously um, they were part of a program that could turn the tide of an entire district. Following this, um, Emily rolled to get her PhD in midwifery at Emory, and Jeffrey is now rolling out this same program in Swaziland with Chai there. And to us, um, it became obvious that Jeffrey and Emily could make an impact in the field of global health now, and this opportunity would affect the way that they would approach the rest of their careers. Um, we need to recruit many more people like them because we know that the more exceptional talent that we get in the field of global health, the possibilities for innovative and creative solutions grows exponentially, and that is what motivates us. But one of our biggest obstacles is that a lot of people that are interested in global health think that they can't engage in this space. They think that on, there's only room for doctors and nurses in this field. And yet we all know that the complexity and scope of today's problems require people with very diverse experiences from technology, from um, psychology, supply chain management, lab system strengthening, engineering, and beyond. And I know that y'all obviously know all of this because you have those skills. Um, but we're working to change this perception. And the way that we're doing it is engaging very non-traditional folks in Global Health Corps. And these are folks like a guy named Amit Salvi, who joined, joined Global Health Corps in our first class as well. Um, when I met Amit, he was a recent engineering graduate from UC Berkeley, and he had been working at The Gap for three years. And specifically, at The Gap, he was working on their gene supply chain. So every day he went to work, and he ensured that Gap genes were getting from warehouses into Gap stores across the United States. And when he found out about Global Health Corps, he applied, and a few months later, he was living in Tanzania. And he was doing the same thing that he had been doing for Gap customers, but this time he was doing it for pay the one million people living on the island of Zanzibar. So instead, he was working with the Ministry of Health in Tanzania to make sure that drugs got from warehouses into clinics, and more importantly, into the hands of the patients that need them most. Um, this was an opportunity for Amit to see that his same skills from working in retail were equally as applicable, and I would argue probably more impactful, um, strengthening drug supply chains. And following his time with Global Health Corps, he moved to Kenya to do the same thing. Um, and lastly, I would love for you to consider two of our fellows, Anne-Marie Brulette and Isaac Magumbele, who have supported some of the work that ASCP has been doing with Chai in Uganda. Prior to joining Global Health Corps, Anne-Marie spent two years working at Credit Suisse in New York, while Isaac was working as a designer and engineer in Uganda. And together, they were working on um, Chai's PMTCT program in Uganda. Um, one of the biggest challenges that Chai was facing was that there were really great, strong labs um, that could test mothers and their infants to find out if they had HIV AIDS. And honestly, I think a lot of these strong labs were largely in part um, because of the ASCP work with Chai. Um, but some of the challenges that they were facing is that um, the turnaround time for a mother to receive her results or her child's results took 30 days because there weren't transport systems to get results from labs to rural areas. And so Anne-Marie and Isaac worked um, by recruiting transport companies. So they basically worked recruiting all of the moped drivers in the districts where they were operating to be their new fleet, their new workforce. And so by recruiting very non-traditional players, they were able to change the turnaround time from 25 days or 30 days to three days. And by turn, changing that turnaround time, 50% of infants that were otherwise not able to get on the drugs that they needed to survive into their third month were able to do so. Um, so by rolling out this new system of transport with labs in one health center, they were able to figure out the best practices from that. And now they are, have rolled it out to testing systems 
to 250 health centers across the country of Uganda to ensure that mothers can find out their child's lab results with plenty of time to ensure that they can survive through their infancy. Um, people like Jeffrey and Emily and Amit and Anne-Marie and Isaac show that everybody has something to contribute to improving global health issues. And though these are the stories of individuals, this is the story of a community of like-minded people with similar values coming together to make change. This is the story of our 450 fellows and alums who now 98% continue to work in global health. 10% um, are actually working for the Minister of Health in the country where they're from, which is exciting for us. And we have big plans for them. We have big visions. Um, last year, we, Yale is our academic partner. And last year at training, this is sort of a cute story, um, one of our fellows named Adana stood up, she's Nigerian, and she said to the group, you know, it is going to be so convenient when I am the Minister of Health in Nigeria. <laughs> and Celine is the Minister of Health in Rwanda, and Diego is running the Gates Foundation, because we're all going to know each other, and we're going to have such a strong network to address all of these issues together. And the reason that I love that story is that Adana completed her fellowship in Newark, New Jersey last year, and she is enrolled at Harvard getting her PhD. And that PhD is being paid for by the Ministry of Health in Nigeria with the stipulation that she returns to Nigeria after receiving it to work for the ministry. So she's already on her way. And to me, the story of Adana and Celine and Diego, wherever they go in their careers, speaks to the power of a community of people that care about making health a human right and ensuring that people live a dignified life. And I think that that's a pretty similar story to ASCP and all of you in this room and the work that you're doing every single day. Through my work, um, I've learned a lot about illness. I've learned a lot about daunting health statistics. But one thing that I've realized that's a lot more contagious than any disease is commitment and passion and the belief that as a community, we can change the course of history. And I am really excited because after talking with Dr. Holliday, I know that y'all agree with that. And so thank you so much for having me. I'm excited now. Um, we're going to have a panel discussion with Dr. Holliday, and I'll be joined by Dr. Lavolsi and Dr. Hunt. And so thank you so much for having me, and I'm excited to continue the conversation.